Mighty Fortress, that is our theme for this portion of the book of Ephesians. I encourage you to take a hymnal or look up the words online to a Mighty Fortress, open Ephesians 6, the passages that we're in, and look at them side by side and meditate and think about how Martin Luther uh, put together such incredible words from this passage of Scripture. It truly is um, an amazing thing to look at. Would you pray with me, please, as we begin? Father, we thank you that you are a mighty fortress, that you are our God, and that you are high and holy and lifted up and exalted above the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the dry land. We draw near to you, Lord, knowing that you will draw near to us. We humble ourselves before you. We thank you that in that humility, Christ came and died in our place and that we have been crucified and buried and raised and seated with him in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and every, every being and every power in all of heaven and earth. And we thank you that we are there with our Savior and our Master. Thank you for the victory that is ours, for you say that you always lead us in the victory in Christ Jesus. And so for that victory we pray now in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. If you take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to the book of Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. We're, this morning we're going to look at verses 13, 14, and 15, but I'd like us to read verses 10 through 15. And so Ephesians 6, we're going to read 10 through 15. Would you please stand as we read God's Word? For we know this is His Word to us. Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10 the Word of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. key word we're going to begin with this morning is the word readiness. When we think of being ready or getting ready for something, we think of I'm getting ready for church, getting ready to go to work, getting ready to go to the gym, getting ready for a test. But when people in the military hear the word readiness, it has a distinct meaning. Those in the military are getting ready for war. That's what the, that's what the military exists for. Did you know that? It's not to get a college education or learn a skill, the purpose of the military is to prosecute a war and to prepare people for battle, whether they are medical corps, whether they are logistics, whether they are cooks, whether they are trigger pullers, um, whether they're pilots, drive ships, whatever it is that they do, everyone prepares for the battle of war. Now, we're in a war, and we've seen that. Uh, last week, we saw our enemy is the devil, meaning the adversary. We're in a spiritual battle. And this devil that we face is, is uh, calculated and cold, and he's smart, and he is crafty, and he uses all sorts of schemes. And there are a, are a myriad of these fallen angelic beings called demons that exist in the world that we're fighting against at all times. And this um, power that we serve, or that we don't serve, that we fight against, like we just sang in the song, for still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. You are not his equal. None of us are his equal. That's why we are to stand firm in the strength of the Lord's might, the one who has defeated him. We have put on the full armor of God, and it is his strength that we fight this battle, and it is not our strength, it is his. So, the main 
command throughout here is stand firm. Stand firm. Jesus has, has won a battle. He has captured us. We belong to him. He has gained ground, and we are to hold the ground. And uh, we're to be part of the battle in uh, wherever we may face it. So this morning we're going to look at um, verses 13 through 15. And if we look at verse 13, uh, we're going to see this. There, there are going to be seasons of attack. And our victory is always assured. Now when I say there are seasons of attack... I don't want to overstate this whole spiritual battle thing so that you, you have um, the wrong impression that you know, there are demons crawling over your bed every night and when you wake up in the morning there's going to be these foul-smelling spirits that you're just you know, doing battle with all the time. That's not the way it is. Notice he says, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. In the evil day. The days are evil, Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, and there is an evil day, which means there are times specifically where the enemy attacks us. Sometimes he attacks us and sometimes he doesn't. There will be days of calm as well as days of evil. We want you to understand that God wishes to bless our lives. Our lives are to be full of joy and confidence and, and, and we should live lives of happiness and blessing, not always on, on the defensive and worried that we're going to be in some horrible spiritual battle. God wishes to bless us, but we must be ready. Just like those who are in the military, they train and they train and they train and they train. Why? To be ready when the battle does come. They're not in a battle every day, but when the battle comes, they need to be ready. One of the uh, uh, sayings that I think all of the branches of the service use that came out of World War I is this, war is months of boredom punctuated by moments of extreme terror. That's what it's like being in a war. There are days and days and days of sheer boredom, just minding your time, but training, being ready, because the battle will come. And that's the way it is in the spiritual life as well. We're not every day going toe-to-toe. Some days are calm and others are not, but the point is we must be ready with this spiritual armor that we're going to look at. Now, there are seasons of attack, obviously, and maybe the reason we're attacked is we've left ourselves open by what? By sin, and we've left ourselves open to attack, and maybe one of the reasons that we are attacked in a season of attack is because we are being used mightily of God. And we're doing something, and we're advancing, and we're walking with Him, and we've got the enemy's attention, and sometimes that's the reason that we're attacked as well. So it's important to understand that seasons of blessing can turn into seasons of attack. Those are the times we need to be wary. Those are the times we we need to be careful that we're not lulled into a sense of of false security. Well, things are going well, so therefore I think everything's going to be okay. No, we need to be careful. We need to be ready. Um, The the day that I was ordained into the ministry, Mike Powell gave me a book by A.W. Tozier, and there was a bookmark in it, and he said, read this today, this chapter. And it's a chapter called The Prayer of a Minor Prophet. And I've prayed that prayer over and over and over again throughout the years. In fact, I almost know it by heart. I've prayed it so many times. But there's a a line in it that says, And Lord, if by your good grace I am the recipient of good gifts from your people, protect me from the blight that that often comes. Oftentimes, when things go well and we're blessed, we need to be ready and we need to stand firm because that might be the time that the enemy might attack. But we see in verse 13, when it does happen, when we are attacked, his armor is sufficient. It is more than enough. It is what we need. It's all we need for any attack of the enemy. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able. Be able. This is a word that that, um, I kind of wish they would have translated it a little bit differently. The noun form of this word is dunamis. You've heard that before we get the word dynamite from it, it means power. And so here it means you can do this. You are able, you have the capability. 
I would say in line with be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, you have the power to withstand. You are able, you have the power to withstand. And then he says, and having done everything. It's all you can do. When you put on his armor, there isn't anything more. That is where your trust is. When we put on the armor, it doesn't guarantee that we're not going to be attacked, but rather it does guarantee that we will win. And so we need to be careful that we we put on this whole armor. We do all we can do. Putting on the armor is the best that you can do. It's all that you can do. It is sufficient. Don't depend upon yourself. Don't depend upon some, some poem or even a prayer that someone wrote, but depend upon his strength and his armor because that's all he's asking of us. We can do this. That means our attitude in this whole realm of spiritual battle is confidence. Never fear. It is always confidence. It is always trust in God. It's never trust in ourselves, but we stand firm with the utmost confidence knowing I've done everything that I can do humanly possible by putting on his armor, and therefore I can stand firm. I'm able to. I have the power to in his strength and the strength of his might. Now we stand firm, this main thing that he's telling us to do, by putting on God's armor. There are six pieces of the armor. I almost said six, just to see what you'd say. Anyway, there are six pieces of the armor. And uh, this morning we're going to look at the first three pieces. We'll look at the next three next week. And the first piece of this armor is truth. And remember, the, the command is to stand firm. And so we are to stand firm in truth. Stand firm, therefore having girded your loins with truth. Loins means your waist. The girding was a belt, basically, a Roman soldier. By the way, Paul was possibly chained to a Roman soldier while he was writing this book. And use this as his portrait, if you will. He's drawing the picture of this Roman soldier, and he sees the the armament that this uh, soldier has he sees his uh, sword and laying uh, up against the, the wall probably and his shield and his helmet is probably off. Maybe he has it on. I don't know. Um, but anyway, he's, he's describing the armament, the armor of this Roman soldier. And a Roman soldier, of course, they didn't wear pants back then. They would wear tunics. So the belt would be a leather piece and it, it served several purposes. One was when necessary in battle, they would tuck the tunic into the belt so that they wouldn't trip over your, you know, the long flowing dress that you wore. The other purpose of it was uh, that they placed their, their daggers or small arms, and that was a place, just a, a belt for that as well. Today, you know, I'm familiar with, uh, with marine battle dress, and marines will wear uh, some kind, uh, like a, uh, a web netting around to begin with, or there's a belt as well. Usually on the belt there is a first aid kit, and uh, that's where ammo is kept, and all Marines have a K-bar as well, which is a, a knife. And, of course, they see their knife as uh, the, you know, the last line of defense in hand-to-hand combat, but it's, what it's mostly used for is opening MREs. But anyway, <laughs> and it's, they endlessly sharpen them. It is so, something to behold. But anyway... Belts are important because today you don't want your pants to fall down in the middle of a battle, right? It holds you together, and the truth binds us together. It holds us together. And I want us to look at truth, particularly in the book of Ephesians, but also in the rest of the New Testament. And remember, we are putting this piece of armor on, this belt around our waist that is truth. What's important to recognize here, and we can get off talking about all the pieces of the armament, and I'm going to give a brief description of of each, but what's most important is what they represent. Don't get so hung up on, you know, what is the belt and the shield and the sword. What do they represent? That is the most important thing because these are virtues that we are to live in our lives. And the first thing I want you to see is that we're saved by the truth. We are saved by the truth. Remember Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Listen very carefully. Look. 
in him, that is in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, you have to hear the message of the truth. What is the message of the truth? The gospel of your salvation. What happens when you listen to the message of the truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, having also believed? You must believe that it's true and place your trust in it. And what happens when you listen to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believe in it, you are sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. How important is truth in the book of Ephesians? Right up front, this is how we are saved, by the truth, and the truth is in the gospel. We see Jesus' words in John 17 where we see that we are sanctified by truth. We know that we're saved by truth, Ephesians 1, but we're sanctified by truth. We come into a relationship with God by truth, but then we grow in our holiness and righteousness by the word of God, which is truth. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, the last night he was with his disciples, he prayed to the Father. He said, Father, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Jesus prayed that for all of his disciples, us, on that night, that we would be made holy in truth, and the truth is God's word. And Jesus himself is truth. John 14, 6, when Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Show us the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus himself is the embodiment of truth. Truth is in Jesus. Back in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it says, grace and truth were realized in Jesus. The embodiment of grace and truth, he lived it out because Jesus is truth. We're saved by truth. We're sanctified by truth. Jesus is truth. But we remember, we're, we are in a spiritual battle, and the devil is the enemy of truth. John 8, 44, Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. What guts to say this to a bunch of religious leaders. You are of your father, the devil. Whoa. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. There's our spiritual battle against the devil. He is the father of lies. He's going to lie to you. He's going to lie about you to other people. He's going to fill your heart and your mind with lies. We don't believe him. We arm ourselves with the truth of salvation. We arm ourselves with the truth of God's word. We arm ourselves with the truth of Jesus Christ himself, and we don't listen to his lies. That's the battle. And so, being saved by this truth, we are to live lives of truth. Again, in Ephesians 4, put on the new self. Remember, put on the armor of God. He says, put on the new self. Same words here. Paul uses this oftentimes to talk about putting on clothing that are virtues. And he says, put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created. In other words, we were recreated, born again. When did that happen? When you listened to the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed. You were recreated in truth, in holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin and do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not let, do not give the devil an opportunity. There's our spiritual battle. How do you fight against the opportunistic evil one? By the truth. The truth of your salvation, the truth of the word of God, the truth of Jesus, the truth of who you are in salvation. We are to put on the new self, recreated in holiness and truth, and we are to live this out. That is what it means to put on the belt of truth. So, our first lesson from the belt of truth is this. If we live lives of truth, we're going to stand out in this culture. If we are people who think truth, believe truth, speak truth, 
we are going to stand out like a sore thumb, I think in a good way, perhaps draw fire from the enemy because people will notice us. Think about truth in our culture right now. Where is it? You know, our, our mission statement is we proclaim biblical truth. As we proclaim biblical truth, we cultivate relationships that are intimate with Christ and active in the church and loving the community, but we start with truth. And truth has fallen on hard times, ladies and gentlemen. There is no truth in our culture. Nobody believes the news media. Nobody believes politicians. Nobody believes judges. Nobody believes uh, academia professors. Nobody believes them anymore. Nobody believes the internet. Nobody believes anything. And I know I'm overstating that, but that's pretty much what we've got. Fake news and the whole thing. We, are, we have a crisis of truth in our culture right now. No one expects anyone to tell the truth. And when we hear of someone who lies, it's like, mm. everybody does. It's the way it is now. But when we, as believers, when we live the truth and we speak the truth, we're going to stick out. We're going to be different. We are to be a peculiar people, and it's important for us to live out of the truth that he has given to us. So our next lesson is that our defense against the father of lies is to know and to believe and to speak and to live the truth. That's how we defend. It's not just we don't put on some belt. We put on actual truth, put on the truth of Christ, but then we live it. We have to live it out like Jesus was uh, grace and truth were realized in Jesus and Jesus needs to be realized in us as he lives through us. So we know and believe and speak and live the truth. And so let me ask you this. When it comes to the truth, do you need to tighten your belt? Or has it become easy to just fudge on the little things, small things? Do you need to tighten your belt when it comes to truth? We, how we do this is we immerse ourselves in truth and we fill our minds with truth. Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, honorable, lovely, etc., etc., let your mind dwell on these things. Number one on that list, Paul says, whatever is true, think about these things. Dwell upon them. Renew your mind with truth. Truth is in Jesus, and sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. There's no shortcut here. You must immerse yourself in the truth. And remember... It's not going to come naturally to us. What comes naturally to us is not truth, but falsehood. And that's why we need to put on truth daily. Now, our second piece of armor is righteousness. And he says, stand firm in righteousness. Stand firm, therefore, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Notice these are all past tense. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness, you are able to stand firm. Now, for the uh, Roman soldier, they had this, uh, um, they had a, a breast piece that they would wear over a leather piece, and the breast piece was made of metal, and it protected the front and it protected the back. And you can imagine, what does it do? It protects your vital organs, right? Today, our, uh, our modern-day soldiers wear uh, Kevlar vests. And, uh, and they protect from shrapnel and uh, debris from explos explosive devices and, and some small arms rounds. Um, uh, they won't always save your life, but they can many, many times because you're protecting the vital organs. And so the Roman soldier going into battle, you know, going without the breastplate of righteousness, arrows, spears, daggers, swords, uh, you are defenseless. So for us, the breastplate is righteousness. The breastplate is righteousness. Now, what is righteousness? We know first and foremost that God alone is righteous. The Evangelical Dictionary of Theology defines righteousness this way. Righteousness is that attribute by which God's nature is seen to be eternally perfect 
the eternally perfect standard of what is right. Wayne Grudem put it this way, God's righteousness means that God always acts in accordance with what is right and is himself the final standard of what is right. You want to know what's right in the world? You want to know what's true? You want to know what's right? It's him. It's God. And we have access to that through the word of God. So he is the standard of all righteousness. And so for us to live righteously means that we conform to God's standard of righteousness and holiness. That's what it means for us to, to live righteously. But God alone is holy and righteous. And Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that we have no righteousness in ourselves. You know this verse. For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Because when we are in sin, before we are regenerate, before we are saved, before we listen to the message of the gospel, sealed in the Spirit, we are in sin, and we are in the realm of sin. And everything that we do, good, bad, and perfect, even all the good that we do, is before God as filthy, because He is the perfect standard of righteousness. That puts us all in the same boat where we are all in need of righteousness. Romans 3.10 says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. So all of us are in the same boat. We need righteousness. And the good news is that God has provided that for us. We are made righteous through faith. Romans 3, 21 through 22. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. When we place our faith in Christ, we receive the righteousness of Christ. It's called justification by faith. That's part of the Reformation. We reclaimed that truth, that we are declared to be righteous in the sight of God because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ who takes away our sin. It's put this way in 2 Corinthians 5, the righteousness we obtain or we receive is Christ's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That's that incredible exchange of the gospel. He takes our sin, and what do we get in return? We get His righteousness. We, are, we have what is called imputed righteousness. We are declared to be righteous. We are justified before God. And then, putting us back in the spiritual battle, being made righteous, we practice righteousness. 1 John 3, little children, make sure no one deceives you. Who's the deceiver? The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he, Jesus, is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. That's the assurance of victory that we have by Jesus. So if we have been made righteous by the righteousness of Christ, what does it say the result will be? We will live righteously. Because Jesus lives in us, because the Spirit lives in us, because God is going to change us and sanctify us in truth, and His Word is truth, and so we must not be deceived thinking, well, I can't be righteous. Yes, you can, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. We stand in His righteousness. Here are two lessons from the breastplate of righteousness. Practical righteousness does not protect us from attack, but it does protect us from defeat. One of the greatest things that we can do in this, what he's describing is walking with God. 
You've been declared to be righteous. Christ lives in you. Now be righteous. Live it by faith. Live out Christ-likeness. Christ Live out that righteousness, and guess what? That is a protection against the enemy. It doesn't, it doesn't ensure that you're not going to be attacked, but it means that you will stand. You will stand. So we must walk in righteousness, the righteousness that he has provided, and become practically righteous in that protects us. On the other hand, our failure in practical righteousness gives the devil an opportunity. When we walk in sin, when we are not paying attention, when we are lulled into a false sense of security, that's when we might stumble and fall because we are not living out the righteousness and laying hold of the righteousness that has been given to us. So we're to stand firm, girding our loins with the truth, putting on the belt of truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. And the third piece of the armor we're going to look at this morning is that we stand firm in the gospel of peace. Stand firm, therefore, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shodding your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, footwear is so important. The Roman soldier, um, they didn't have boots. They, they were more like sandals, but they did have um, steel cleats on the bottom to give them um, the ability to stand firm in the midst of a battle. Um, they weren't really meant for running long distances, but anybody who's been in the, in the military, you know how important taking care of your feet is. Uh, having proper footwear and keeping... Uh, wearing proper socks, keeping your, your feet dry, you get blisters, you're out of the game. You, you can't go to the front line. You, you have feet problems. You, that it used to be, uh, I don't think they do this anymore, uh, but it used to be if you had flat feet, you couldn't serve. You were disqualified. And, and even today, if you have something wrong with your feet, they're going to sideline you because you can't do the job. That's how important it is for us to have our feet firmly prepared and planted in the gospel. He says the preparation of the gospel. This is readiness. Are you ready? Are you standing in readiness and standing firm? Now, let's look at what peace means in the book of Ephesians and throughout. The gospel brings peace with God. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. This is the, uh, Paul is actually quoting Isaiah 52, 7 here. The bringing the good news, the good news is the gospel. And the gospel brings peace to those who accept it. Romans 5, 1 says this, therefore, having been justified, made righteous, by faith in the gospel, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We were once his enemies. We believe in the gospel. We listen to the message of the truth. And we, we are born again. We are created in righteousness and holiness of truth. And we are now reconciled to God and we have peace with God. That's what the gospel of peace does. But the gospel also brings the peace of God. Many of you have this in your memory banks. I hope you do. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God in the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. When you are at peace with God and when you depend upon Him in prayer and thanksgiving, that peace, you have peace of God that guards you in the battle. But also, the gospel brings peace with one another. Ephesians 2.14, For He Himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Remember, 
Jew and Gentile, different people, disparate people, enemies of one another, he made peace with them. Peace with God brings peace with one another. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having been put to death, to put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace those, to those who are far away, the Gentiles, and peace to those who are near, the Jews. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. He brings people together, men and women and boys and girls in different countries, in different colors, in different cultures, in different genders. And we come together, we have peace with one another. Why? Because we have peace with God. So we need to put that peace on that the gospel brings. We need to, as uh, uh, Jerry Bridges says in his book, The Disciplines of Grace, we, we must preach the gospel to ourselves over and over and over again. It's not just something, I'm saved by the gospel and now I move on to something else. We're saved by the gospel, but then we live the gospel and we must preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. I'm not worthy, but Christ died for me. I have righteousness because of him. I must humble myself daily and daily die to self and preach the gospel over and over and over and over again. If we fail to do this, we will fail to live it. So preach the gospel to yourself every single day. And we see this. We are to preserve the unity that peace creates through the gospel. Ephesians 4, 2, and 3, remember this? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, pay attention, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why do we have peace? Because we've been reconciled to the gospel, to one another and to God. And it's our responsibility to preserve that because we know his schemes, and one of the things he's going to try and do is destroy the peace among us. So, remember chapter 4, let me just read it to you. He says, uh, back in chapter 4, 25 and following, he said, um, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not sin. And do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of, of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And in the middle of that was do not give the devil an opportunity. You know what he uses? Lies, laziness, bitterness, anger, slam, slander, sins of the tongue, refusal to forgive. Drives a wedge between us. So, some final thoughts here. The gospel of peace. We are to be peace proclaimers. And I think, you know, many times, uh, most scholars say um, that all of the pieces of the armor are defensive except for the sword. And to that I say, I don't think of any of them were ever in combat. Because when you are fired upon, you return fire. You have to be ready, but, uh, but your armament is not just primarily defensive, it's defensive for, for the pur purpose of being on the offense, winning the battle. And I know the, it, the main command is to stand firm, we do, but I think we're to be progressing as well. And I think the proclamation of the gospel and, and winning back people and bringing them into the kingdom of God, rescuing them from the domain of darkness so that they might be transferred into the kingdom of light, that is our responsibility. We are ambassadors for Christ. And so we, we, we should be peace proclaimers, bringing good news to the lost, because he was 
uh, the, the passage that he quoted in Isaiah is, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. We are to be good news bringers, not just standing, taking hold of the, the gospel and huddling here. We are to proclaim it. Second of all, we are to be peacemakers. When there's division, when we're at odds, we need to make peace with one another. We need to help others make peace because we're to preserve the unity that peace comes through the gospel. That's living out the gospel. That's what it means to live the gospel and preach the gospel among us, that by virtue of the fact that we are, none of us are worthy, we're all saved by grace through faith, humbled ourselves, have been changed into the likeness of Christ, therefore it is incumbent upon us to keep the peace among us. And the enemy will always seek to divide us by destroying the unity that is the fruit of peace. And third, I ask you to do this. Put on each of these virtues that the armor represents. Paul uses the, this imagery of the soldier, and, and this reminds me more of the teachings of Jesus than it does Paul. Paul doesn't do this very often. He usually um, just speaks with propositional truth. You've been justified by faith. All are sinners and come short of the glory of God. But here he uses this. It can serve, I think, very well as a mnemonic device to remember, to picture what, it, what are the pieces and the parts of the armor so that we might use this as a device of faith and prayer to daily, if necessary, or when under attack, prepare ourselves by praying on and claiming and thinking about these pieces of the armor. So this week, I encourage you to do that. Take Ephesians 6 and pray through verses 13 through 17 and put on each of the pieces of the armor. And you can do that like this. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for giving us all that we need to stand firm. And Father, we gird ourselves with the truth you said, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. We, we put on the truth of your word and the truth of Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray that we might put on that truth in such a way that we would speak truth, each one with his neighbor. We put on the breastplate that is righteousness. Father, there is no righteousness in our own, and we put on that, the righteousness of Christ given to us by faith, because he died and took away our sin. And we put on that righteousness and we pray that it, that righteousness would result in righteous thoughts and righteous words and righteous deeds. We shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. May we be ready to quickly proclaim the, the peace that others can have. May we be quick and ready to make peace with those that we are at odds with and thus live out the gospel. We take up, Father, the shield of faith because we know that it alone and you alone can extinguish the fiery attacks of the enemy. And we thank you, Lord, that it is our faith and our trust in you that does so. We put on our heads the helmet of salvation, protect our minds from the thoughts of this world. May we think thoughts and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Thank you that we have assurance of salvation, and I pray that we would think that way. And we take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We ask, Lord God, that the Spirit of God would use the Word of God to make us like the Son of God, that we might stand firm in His name. Amen.